Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sabine Fuss. I'm an economist by background and I work at the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change in Berlin, Germany. And I'm very honored to give a general background to the topic of negative emissions at this launch event for the IE Nets project that I'm actually very much looking forward to. So what do we talk about when we talk about negative emissions? Well, negative emissions stands for um, the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, and there are different ways to do this. One way that you see in the upper left corner depicted is to enhance our terrestrial sinks, either by afforestation or reforestation, and the logic is that the additional tree growth takes up more CO2 from the atmosphere and stores it uh, within forests. Then in the upper right corner, um, you see a much debated um, option, which is called bioenergy with uh, carbon capture and storage, short backs. So the same idea applies here. You grow more vegetation that takes up CO2 and then when you combust this biomass or um, use it otherwise to generate energy, you don't release the CO2 embedded in this biomass back into the atmosphere, but you capture it and store it underground. Then you can also um, use partly burned biomass to add it to soils that then absorb additional CO2. That's called biochar, which you see here in the middle left. Um, and uh, enhanced weathering um, is a process where you crush minerals into very, very, very fine um, components and apply these also to the soil where through chemical reaction, it absorbs additional CO2. In the lower left corner, you see ocean fertilization, and the idea is to use iron or other nutrients and apply them to the ocean, and thereby again increasing um, its capacity to absorb CO2 by algae growth in this case. And then finally, in the lower right corner, you see the example of direct air capture, where um, CO2 is um, removed uh, directly from ambient air through a chemical process and then stored again underground. So why do we need this? What you see in the uh, fifth assessment report of the IPCC is that those stabilization pathways, and I've plotted here out um, actually all the representative concentration pathways that um, the IPCC assessed in its last assessment cycle, um, but if you want to end up with a relatively high likelihood of reaching a two degree target, we're actually looking at RCP 2.6, which are the bluish and greenish lines on the lower spectrum of this, um, of this um, RCP um, picture. So what strikes you immediately is that towards the end of the century, we don't actually decarbonize, it's, we don't end up at zero um, emissions, but in uh, most of the cases, we actually cross the zero line and uh, withdraw more CO2 from the atmosphere than we release back into it. So all of these that you see are the ones that I'm talking about. And actually, this is what you see when you look at the net emissions, but what we do in fact is in these scenarios that we already start much earlier to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, it's just not enough to show up in these uh, net emission um, pathways uh, because we're still emitting uh, more CO2 through the combustion of fossil fuels and land use change um, back into the atmosphere. 
So this is what you see in the following graph um, where I show the gross negative emissions um, through BACs um, in a typical RCP 2.6 scenario. And um, this is depicted here by the red area. And you see that already in the first half of the century, you start removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So that means um, if we look at um, deployment and research and all that, we shouldn't just focus at the end of the century and think that we still have a lot of time. And that's also why um, the IENETS project is a very timely project because it will prepare already knowledge for this um, early transition that we need in order to ramp up net negative emission technologies. So if we further dive a little bit deeper into the AR5 scenarios that I've just shown you, um, this picture gives you um, the net CO2 emissions on the y-axis against uh, the BAX deployment in 2100 as a share of total primary energy. And what you see is that the bluish and greenish, remember that I told you that these are the ones with a relatively high likelihood of ending up um, at the two degree warming target, are actually all in uh, below the zero line. And they actually show quite big percentages. Remember, this is the percentage of total primary energy and about 67% um, um, have a back share in primary energy exceeding 20% in 2100. That is really massive. And uh, 101 of these 116 dots, so these low stabilization um, scenarios, rely on backs. If we then look at uh, the sectors and what that means, you see immediately that um, in the electricity sector in 2100, we go um, negative, very much so actually. Um, also net land use is um, a little bit more than um, uh, decarbonized. Um, transport is still has some positive emissions, but transport is also very difficult to decarbonize. Um, buildings are almost at zero and industry as well. Where we also see residual positive emissions are the non-CO2 greenhouse gases, and these are mostly associated with our food system. So an ad additional word about transport. Um, in those scenarios um, where we actually switch off um, BECs, so either by forbidding um, CCS, the carbon capture and storage, or by limiting the amount of um, biomass for bioenergy production, um, you actually do see that uh, these scenarios um, become a lot more expensive in order to reach the two degree target. And also there is still a lot of pressure on land to put biomass because you then have to decarbonize transport. And while you can decarbonize um, the car fleet through electrification, you're still stuck with um, aviation. So aviation will still have some opportunities to um, reduce emissions through efficiency gains or also through demand side measures. But as we don't see that materializing at a sufficient pace and scale, um, biofuels will then be um, the last resort in order to um, quickly decarbonize um, aviation as well. So one way or the other, the problem doesn't go away. Um, but these would be two levers to enter to reduce the dependence on, on negative emissions. The non-CO2 um, GHGs and also the transport sector. Now, as you know, after the Paris Agreement, um, we're no longer just looking into uh, the two degree target, but um, the aspiration is to stabilize well below two degrees or even at 1.5 degrees. 
So there is relatively um, little research published on this yet, but um, there are quite a couple of um, things in the pipeline. And um, one uh, publication that is already out um, from uh, the end of 2015 um, actually looks at a at those uh, 1.5 degree scenarios that had already been available at that time and compared those to um, the standard two degree scenarios that I've just shown you. And what you see in the left panel is that um, while there are um, likely um, two degree scenarios that have a global accumulated um, removal of CO2, so negative emissions um, until the end of the century, um, on average around four or five hundred gigaton CO2. Um, we speak about a much larger average when we look at the 1.5 degree scenarios. So here, um, on average, we're talking about 800 gigatons CO2, and um, that is actually quite a bit. Um, also important to mention is that there are actually some two degree um, sea pathways that can do without backs. So they, they reach the warming target without um, actually deploying negative emission uh, emissions from backs. Some of them do that then by afforestation. Some do that then in a lot more expensive um, way. But um, at least there is some flexibility. But the flexibility to reach 1.5 degrees without negative emissions is very, very limited. So most of the times we're looking at scenarios that do have an overshoot above 1.5 degrees and only return towards the temperature target towards the end of the century. And that can only be achieved by removing um, CO2 from the atmosphere. So what will be the struggle for AR6 then? The sixth assessment report of the IPCC is that we're having more and more research on this and it's scattered across a whole lot of different communities, disciplines and um, also different uh, research outlets. Um, here you see this exponential curve in both of the figures on the right hand side um, broken down across the um, disciplines and on the left hand side where I actually would like to draw your uh, attention to um, highlighted by uh, assessment report and so if we extrapolate um, the bluish uh, trend then we will be looking for the sixth assessment cycle at, at as many uh, publications as we've had for the previous uh, for assessment reports and that is a lot. So what we're doing at my institute is also to look into novel ways to synthesize this knowledge not only for um, policymakers but also for the modeling community. And um, that is actually why I'm also quite pleased to be on board um, for this uh, project because that gives me the chance to um, know of um, emerging insights, especially at country level, which is very valuable because a lot of the literature actually looks at uh, the global level and uses very rough numbers in order to come up with potentials. I am also um, on the scientific steering committee of the Global Carbon Project. Some of you might actually have heard about it. Uh, we're bringing out the carbon budget at each end of the year and uh, that is one of the flagship projects but we also have a research initiative um, called um, Magnet Managing Global Negative Emission Technologies where we try to provide a platform for research um, internationally on negative uh, emissions and um, what we've been trying to do is to pull together different disciplines as well, both to see what are sustainable potentials, but also to have a look at the um, mitigation pathways. So 
um, the influence of other options. I was talking before about the non-CO2 GHGs, for instance. Um, if we had a breakthrough there, how much would that um, reduce our dependence on negative emissions? Um, how would uh, bringing in other um, technologies that could remove CO2 um, alleviate the pressure on land, for instance, and so on. Um, a third, also uh, a component that looks at the carbon cycle, and um, we've been able to attract some research from Earth system modeling there, uh, where you where people look at um, issues of impacts of removing large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere on the carbon cycle. Um, a question such as whether there's hysteresis and so on. And then fourth, of course, the whole complex around governance, policies, incentivizing um, negative emissions. So I don't have too much time to go into detail into all those um, parts of this pie chart. So let me just say something that we did on sustainable potentials. Um, that is a study that we conducted together with Pete Smith from the um, University of Aberdeen and which basically looks at the supply side of negative emission technologies that um, gets limited uh, by a number of factors, biophysical resource limits, where of course um, the debate has been circling a lot around um, the land area, criticizing that um, the additional biomass that we would need to grow would take up too much land, but we still have a growing population that needs to be fed, biodiversity that needs to be conserved, and other ecosystem services that need to be fostered. Um, economic limits as well, as I um, was already alluding to, and you'll see in a minute, um, some of those technologies are also still rather costly, um, energy intensive, need nutrients, then um, societal limits, there has been a big pushback, especially on BECs, because people either have concerns about the barrier energy part or actually about the um, carbon capture and storage part, where most of the opposition was actually on the storage component. Then um, also, as I just mentioned, uh, limits uh, from the carbon cycle on the climate side, um, which we are not going to discuss here. All of this serves to um, compress the supply of, of negative emission technologies um, that we would be able to exploit. On the other hand, there are also some forces that help us to expand that. So breakthroughs in crop yields, for instance, that would allow us to grow more biomass on a um, specific um, amount of land. Um, the removal of policy barriers or early testing at multiple scales. So these are things that can actually show us where we can um, increase um, the potential supply of negative emission technologies. What we did then in this study was to um, look um, at the impacts on non-climate goals as well, responding a bit to the debate um, around uh, uh, BECs and also afforestation, where a lot of concern was voiced. So we looked at the average removal of CO2 in the AR5 scenarios that were consistent with a more than 50% probability of achieving the two degree target. And on average, those scenarios were withdrawing 12 gigaton CO2 per year at the end of the century. So then we took this number and calculated backwards what would that removal um, through BACs imply for resources such as land, water, nutrients, energy, but also what would be the effect on the albedo, um, what would be the cost. And of course we could not only rely on the scenarios here, but we had to also go back to the literature, to technology studies, to bottom-up estimates in order to come up with numbers here. And then finally, we also looked into other emerging negative emission technologies and asked ourselves, okay, can we actually go so far with those other options? Do we manage by the end of the century to withdraw 12 gigatons CO2 or not? And what would the implications of that be? 
and where we could not actually um, see that the full potential of 12 gigatons of CO2 per year could be reached, we just calculated the maximum potential and the implications of that. So going back to, to, to all those options, we chose in this particular study to look at afforestation and reforestation next to BECS, but also at enhanced weathering and direct air capture. For now, we did not focus on ocean fertilization, um, even though there is also a, a big literature um, on this. But um, the, uh, the current um, consensus on um, whether that could actually be something that would be able to go forth in the short run was limited also for political reasons, of course. And then the other thing that was not con uh, considered here was biochar or other ways um, of using uh, soil carbon sequestration. And But this has been uh, done in a different paper now using the same setup. So there are also comparable numbers for that. But as the potentials were considerably lower and also the implementation options very different, we focused on the um, other technologies in this particular study. I cannot go uh, through um, all of the implications now, so I just plucked out land and energy because these are the ones that are most often um, discussed in the, in the public debate. And what you see here on the left-hand side is basically the hectares um, that you require to capture one ton of, um, uh, of, of carbon. And um, you see that if you do a BEX on the basis of crops, then uh, you need uh, quite uh, a bit of land. Um, whereas if you um, do it on the basis of a forest, um, you, you might end up uh, with, um, with numbers that are a little bit lower than dedicated crops. But if we look at um, afforestation and especially also tropical afforestation, um, we, we might actually end up with a quite similar land footprint than Bax. So the common argument that you always get that Bax is, is very, very bad and that you should better plant some additional trees to do the same, to get the same effect, um, is actually not really true as we found out in this study. Um, also, afforestation would need quite a bit of land in order to, um, to reach the same removal of CO2. And then in the middle you see other options of removing CO2 um, such as direct air capture and um, enhanced weathering that typically have a very low um, land footprint. On the right hand side you see basically the mirror image where direct air capture and enhanced weathering um, have a, a high requirement for energy. And uh, where Bax um, is actually um, on the negative uh, side because it produces energy. And um, that is actually something that also explains um, the, uh, the attractiveness of, of Bax um, using the energy as a sort of entry point. However, that should not be evaluated too highly because what can actually be said is that um, without a sufficiently high CO2 price, you would not see backs. So in the scenarios, you don't do backs because it produces bioenergy, but it um, is done because it removes CO2. And if you have an escalating CO2 price, um, which is very, very high in the end of the century, then of course um, it pays off. Um, to use bags in order to extract CO2 from the atmosphere, even if you have cheaper opportunities to produce energy. So what that already shows, um, or gives a little bit of, a, of an idea about, is that um, we think that in the end you will be actually looking into a portfolio of negative emission technologies that minimize the respective risks and maximizes the negative emissions uh, potential. And uh, what you see here is a very complicated picture that I'll explain in a second, which is supposed to uh, summarize all the impacts that we've been looking at. 
and uh, it tries to be very multidimensional and uh, starts getting, I have to admit, a little bit confusing by that. So what you see on the left hand side um, or on the left axis is basically the negative emissions uh, potential where uh, backs and direct air capture and afforestation all uh, manage to reach those 12 gigaton CO2 which is about 3.3 um, gigaton C um, per year at the end of the century. However, as you see in that bright orange color, uh, Bex has a, a, a very um, high uh, land footprint and afforestation could have an even higher land footprint. Both have pretty high water footprints, which cannot be said of duck. Um, direct air capture has a very low land footprint, um, relatively low requirement also for um, uh, for water, but it does need quite a bit of energy and doesn't produce any. Similarly for enhanced weathering, uh, which might be a little bit of a surprise to some, but if you think about how fine you have to grind uh, those minerals in order to get um, this uh, chemical reaction going when you spread it over agricultural areas, um, that is actually where the, where the big energy requirement is coming from. So in conclusion, um, all negative emission technologies run into their respective limits. We think that we will most likely look into a portfolio of them, as I said before, and we see that the negative emissions technology potential is diminished um, by a lot of um, different factors. Other things that we've been looking into but that I couldn't cover here are public acceptance, governance, but also carbon cycle feedbacks and hysteresis. And one thing that I would really like to emphasize here is that negative emission technologies have to be seen concomitant with early standard abatement and they're not an excuse for continuing on a business as usual path in terms of emissions. So it is, even though it has been described as such, um, it is not correct to say that negative emissions are something that you just turn on at the end of the century to withdraw a bit of CO2. Um, these technologies need a large infrastructure or a long time um, before forests are grown as well. Um, and um, they need maintenance um, and they uh, definitely um, cannot turn around um, from a very high emissions path a concentration pathway where we've already um, left uh, those paths that I've shown you in the beginning of the um, presentation. So um, we've also discussed ways to reduce the dependence on negative emission technologies um, while still aiming for ambitious stabilization targets. Well, one is to start even earlier and even more massively with abatement and the other thing is to um, look uh, into those areas that are um, difficult to abate and here I was mentioning the example of non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. Now let me use the last minute to come up with a couple of research gaps and food for thought and why I actually think that the IE NETS project can make a very valuable contribution to the debate that I've tried to give you a little bit of a background to here. Well, first of all, um, there has been uh, quite a fierce debate about negative emissions in Europe especially, and that shows that um, we have to spend more time identifying risks and making those transpar uh, transparent especially with respect to sustainability concerns. But I think what's a little bit missing from this debate and where the project could make a difference is to also look into opportunities as well. Um, so in terms of backstock could be opportunities in the bioeconomy, in the terms of afforestation, um, that uh, is especially, for instance, for tropical regions, um, also the use of carbon revenues, um, reforestation and sustainable forest management that could then also be used to finance sustainable development goals.
and so on. Furthermore, we'll have to look more into other negative emission technologies than uh, BECs. I think this will also be something that will be geographically quite um, differentiated and we also have to take into account their interactions and also their possible trade-offs with other mitigation options. So um, there are also other mitigation options that um, demand uh, land, for instance, so bioenergy without CCS, for instance, or um, Red Plus, where you um, reduce um, deforestation. So uh, finally, I think um, a lot of the analysis that I've shown you is actually uh, global and uh, is uh, based on um, ag very aggregate data, on, on averages and so on. And I think what is really needed is more on the national and regional level. How does that match with um, the potentials that global models deploy, um, especially in those very low stabilization pathways? Is that realistic? Or do we actually find even more loopholes where we could even have even more negative emissions? Um, the scale and pace of the deployment as well, what is um, actually possible? in a national context and finally policy and business models um, that enable this development and that of course is again very context specific and has to be embedded in um, national and regional um, systems of governance and legislation as well. So with that um, I would close this and I'm happy to answer more questions and also participate uh, in the debate about uh, the project. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, so thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we do appreciate your, your taking time out from a very busy meeting uh, and the, you had to run, a, run across uh, to another venue. For, so we certainly do appreciate that. Um, uh, we just listened to your recorded talk and I asked people to delay their applause, but now can you show your appreciation, please? <laughs> and sorry that I cannot be there in person. I, I would have really liked to, to meet everyone. Okay, well thank, thank you very much. Um, so, so that brings us, we, we have about 10 or 15 minutes now if anybody uh, has specific questions for Dr. Foose. So, Will anybody lead us off on this? And as I said, I'd, I'd appreciate if you use the microphone for us. Okay, Frank. Um, thanks, thanks. Is this working? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. Um, just a question about direct carbon removal from the atmosphere. I know a Swiss plant has been opened or will be opened very shortly. Um, how do you see that technology evolving? And do you see much more new technologies coming out, not just in carbon capture and storage, but in carbon capture and use? Yes, so this is an excellent uh, question. The uh, the Swiss plan, I think either the launch was this week or, or next week, is particularly interesting because it does exactly what you what you were saying in your second part of the question. It uh, utilizes the, the the CO2 because what you've actually seen in the in the talk in the scenarios and the CCF with the decarbonization that you see in the, in the uh, ambitious stabilization pathways is of course triggered by an escalating uh, CO2 price. And uh, this is something that we're currently not seeing globally. So um, the, the use or, or considering the CO2 that you capture as a resource is one entry point in order to, to get those technologies um, going. Um, of course, you have to be careful whether you really um, uh, generate negative emissions from that because uh, depending on what you use it for um, and if that doesn't have a climate relevant time horizon so for instance if you I don't know, make fertilizer from that and then you bring it out on the fields and basically release it back 
other cycle, you of course uh, don't really um, move CO2 from the carbon cycle. However, if you put it in a product that you permanently store as well, then it looks already a little bit different. So I think these two sides of um, CO2 utilization on one hand, you have to um, consider whether the CO2 is really taken out of the, of the carbon cycle and in a lot of cases where it's used, it's not. Um, on the other hand, it's in the absence of carbon pricing or other incentives uh, to, to commercialize this technology, um, an entry point um, that uh, is especially attractive um, for, uh, for the industry, yes. Anybody else want to come in? Just wait for the microphone there. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure is the mic working. Just um, you mentioned yes. incentives and market price for carbon, and just maybe this is a gap in my knowledge, and everyone else knows this. But uh, are there provisions for um, effectively trading negative units or creating a unit that you can sell if you can prove, you know, uh, correctly that you've actually sequestered a or, or used in a product uh, a ton of CO2? So uh, currently in the emissions trading uh, systems that, that, that are actually, um, that we actually do see in the world, I am not aware that, that this is already uh, possible because I think you would need to set up certain mechanisms to, to verify um, the amount that you would actually get. But in effect, how it is implemented in those scenarios that you've been um, seeing and that the IPCC assessed, so these integrated assessment scenarios, um, it, it works like that. Basically, you're, you're towards the end of the century, you're getting an income from uh, the CO2 price that you get through the negative uh, CO2 emissions. And that's actually also one reason why you see this large deployment. It's actually not because uh, bioenergy and CCS is generating a lot of very valuable uh, energy that makes it so attractive. It's the extra income that you also get from the carbon pricing. But that is uh, definitely something policy, governance, and actually also the market mechanisms that would be in place in order to, to get these technologies going is something that, that we definitely need more um, input on. Sabine, uh, I, I'm actually going to use my um, <laughs> moderator's privilege to ask a follow-up question there and I, I think you mentioned to me when, when we were discussing this event beforehand uh, that you had been doing some recent work on the EU ETS uh, system uh, and, and the reform of that but looking at the slides you presented they indicated um, a likely requirement on, on these NETS type scenarios for meeting the, the two degree goal and especially the 1.5 degree goal they seem to be showing nets deployment, uh, significant nets deployment even from 2020 onwards. So in the case of Europe, presumably, if, if the incentives were to come via selling uh, the carbon credits, um, the EU e ETS would have to accommodate that, but more importantly, the carbon price in the EU ETS would have to be sufficient to incentivize um, BEX type or other negative emissions type uh, activity. So I'm just wondering if you, if you could comment on the interaction, the early interaction, not the second half of the century, but the next five or 10 yeah. years. Definitely. I mean, what you're saying is very true because if you actually look at the, the, the gross, uh, I also had a slide on the gross emissions and you see that basically you would need to start setting up this infrastructure a lot earlier than towards the end of the century. And of course, that would need to be incentivized in some way. Now, if we look at the EU ETS that I've been doing some work on, we see a very low price that's somewhere hovering around uh, five euros per ton of, of CO2. And that's typically very far away from the prices that we see in those uh, scenarios. So what's also been discussed is whether um, in the in the absence of um, of a reform that would quickly raise the price, uh, whether you would um, need complementary um, uh, policies that would uh, enable uh, an earlier set off of of these technologies. So um, 
what we've uh, we've actually tried to look a little bit into why the price is so low, whether that's really because of economic activity being low or whether that's uh, because of other short-term market-related abatement fundamentals. And uh, what our research was showing was that there is definitely also um, a problem with credibility and people not actually um, believing in, in, an, in a new ETS reform um, coming uh, through that would, that would raise prices in the short term significantly. And that's, of course, uh, very bad news for, for such technologies. I, um, there are actually uh, other um, um, trading schemes like the one in California and so on that at least have a minimum price. Um, that is something that had also been discussed but is currently off the table again for the EU ETS. So we'll we'll definitely have to have to see how that evolves. But definitely we should also be thinking about uh, alternative complementary policies as long as uh, as as carbon pricing is still um, hovering at such at such low levels. Can I just ask, do you have off the top of your head? For any of the technologies you mentioned, BEX or, or direct air capture, uh, e even a ballpark estimate of the carbon price that would be necessary to make them viable today. Oh, I'm I'm actually not an expert on direct air capture, but what I can say is that it's currently still a lot, like at least um, from the literature, it's uh, it's still a lot more expensive than what we what we see from the BEX literature. Um, because it's quite um, energy intensive uh, because basically you need a lot of um, energy to set off these chemical processes that absorb um, the CO2 from the ambient air. Of course, if you have, uh, if you find um, uh, cheaper energy sources, then uh, that, that could quickly change, of course. So I think all these cost estimates that are, that are out there, and uh, then also the corresponding CO2 price you would need to trigger that are, are actually quite dynamic and depend a lot on uh, what we will actually see if we get first uh, pilots and, and experiments. So I'm actually very curious what will be coming out of the uh, Swiss uh, plant. And they actually promised that as soon as they had some numbers, they would, uh, they would actually be happy to share them. So that might also be nice for your project to, to consider. Okay, excellent. I, I just mentioned in passing, uh, you, you may not be aware, but in relation to a floor price in the ETS and, and hopefully an escalating floor price in the ETS, um, the, the Irish Climate Change Advisory Council, which was established under our climate legislation last year, uh, actually wrote to our Minister for Climate Action uh, recommending that um, Ireland should support uh, the introduction of a floor price in the ETS. I'm, I'm not sure whether the Minister actually took that advice on board or what the Irish position in ETS reform is, but certainly the, the Advisory Council uh, supported that kind of measure. Um, now, uh, we, we have time for one or two more questions from the floor for Dr. Foose, if anybody would like to follow up. Yeah. My name is the Consulting Engineer. My problem with uh, this climate change is about government policies, terms of industries, because of the cost, the overall cost, because the targets are not going to be met if the companies are not seeing the cost beneficial to this carbon emissions reduction. You know, and the government is also not helping by making these things tax, some form of tax reductions. So it's really affecting the, it's affecting some of this compliance to some of your, the, some of these uh, technologies. So if industries think uh, they will save money by not complying, I think they will take that option. But I think most of the governments are not really paying, you know, stringent uh, efforts to make this thing workable. So, what do you think with all these targets, yeah. all these projections? It might just be ac academic, you know. 
So how do you think you can uh, ensure that some of these things, uh, also the industry, come in between and then uh, versus the profits, you know, industrial profits? How do you think we can achieve that? Yes, so this is exactly the, the, the credibility problem that I was also talking about before when we looked into why is actually the price so low in the, in the EU ETS that um, if you have constantly low prices and then people say, well, actually there's nothing wrong because we're still meeting our short-term targets and so on because maybe the economy is a bit low and we have more renewables than we thought and so on. Still, if you keep the cap fixed, like if you still have this temperature target that implies that you're only allowed to emit a certain amount of, of, of CO2, then at some point in time, the price will have to rise tremendously in order to, 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 to still make that. And I think referring to that people don't, that is actually what you're also referring to. It, like if it comes to that and prices will explode like that, there will be a huge outcry and people will say, okay, the industry cannot really accept this and, and, and there will be leakage and, and, and everything will be terrible and people will resist uh, then this, this, this uh, large uh, increase in, in, in the price. And, uh, and, and, and that's probably, I mean, that's what I personally think is a little bit at the heart of this, of this credibility problem where, um, where basically, uh, that basically you are also pointing to. People are not buying that they, and that's why they, they don't think they will need to comply to such an extent in the, in the future. And that's why we actually observe um, this this uh, this low price. I mean, it gets actually reflected in the low price already today. Okay, one last question. Toss up here. I'll go here. Hello, uh, I am Dr. Korte Charuchandra, and uh, I'm basically a structural engineer, and I'm working in uh, uh, areas of uh, sustainable materials. So my question is. Uh, regarding one of your slide which showed that uh, the hectares of land required for plantations uh, with uh, some pine or bruce plantations a uh, certain amount of hectare for containing co2 and uh, tropical plantations requiring higher amount of land for containing co2 so uh, basically being from india a tropical climate country i want to know that was there a batch of plants that you have considered for uh, this or what was the basis? I think it's actually completely different <laughs> because and that's actually makes me think that this is not the nicest uh, panel because I think this is also lumping um, afforestation into into it so that you mean the, the very right bar um, on that panel that's true that actually we, we, we should be uh, we should be separating um, we should be separating that out, but I can I can definitely share the underlying um, assumptions uh, about both um, plantations for biomass for Bex and for the afforestation in um, in tropical countries. With you, I'm I'm sure that Barry can provide you with my with my email address, and I can follow up on which species are are um, contained in that. Yeah, that would be nice. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, but we're we're, we're gonna draw this section to close. Thank you very much. Yes. Sabine, if you don't mind, I'll stay along for the for the introduction to the to the project work packages. Or? Yes, please, please do. Super. Thank you. I'll mute myself.